Hello and welcome to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's DIFF, the online festival of ideas that's designed to shift mindsets and inspire action toward a circular economy. A circular economy promises a future where goods and their components circulate at high value, but that's not going to happen, according to our guest in this show, unless companies and product designers design in good repair experiences. Now, what does she mean by that? We're about to find out. Our guest is Grace Kane, who's a design consultant for DCA Design in the UK. And amongst other things, she works on uh, user insight and sustainable product development. Grace, it's a real pleasure to have you on at the DIFF. Thanks very much. It's a real pleasure to be on. So tell us about good design experiences. Is designing in a good design experience as simple as uh, providing a step-by-step -step guide and using Phillips screws? Very good question. Um, so, so to frame this, you mentioned that repairability is a really important part of the circular economy. This is basically a lot of things currently go to waste because they are broken, they don't get fixed, people just buy a new one um, rather than upgrading or being able to repair them. And so the idea of designing products for repairability is something that now gets talked about quite a lot of can we design this so that it doesn't end up in landfill. And in product design, I think in the past, this has really been talked about in a very technical sense as a, as, a, as a property of the product itself. Like, is it repairable or is it not? And often that's defined, as you said, in terms of things like, does it take Phillips screws? Um, can anybody take it apart with a screwdriver and a suction cup in their basement, that kind of thing. Um, but what I would argue is that you can't just look at a product and tell how repairable it is because so much of what determines whether it's going to be repaired um, is determined by the context. So who's using it? How are they using it? What's it being used for? Um, what happens when it breaks? And is there actually motivation and time and a system there in order to fix it? So I, as an example for this, um, the example I always like to use is to ask which of the, uh, to look at cars and say, which is more repairable, right? To, to take two very extreme examples. In the one case, a Formula One car. So going into a pit stop. Um, and in the other case, a classic car that's sitting in your garage and somebody has been tinkering with for years and years. So which of these two is more repairable? And it's actually a bit of a tricky question because they're both, repairable in very very different ways the classic car um anybody can do it you can do it with off-the-shelf tools um the parts are often available um it's very easy to get into it's very modular um and people actually buy them because they want to repair them and they like them um whereas the formula one car uses all proprietary parts so proprietary that actually some of them are unique to that car and that car alone um and it's definitely not repairable by anybody, but a team of complete experts who train for years to do it. But the average length of the pit stop is about you know, two or three seconds. So it's repairable in the sense that it's about the, the sort of fastest repairable machine you can get, um, but it's, it, that's defined in a very different way. And I think that analogy does carry over into consumer products. A lot of them fall in any place along the line between something that should and could be repaired very fast through a sort of service system and something that's more of a thing that users should and could be able to tinker with and fix themselves. And when you said the design experience, the first thing I think of is um, me trying to, I don't know, swap a screen out on an iPhone or something like yeah. that. But it's, it's more than that, isn't it? It's like you were saying with the um, vintage car, the, the whole experience of owning it is wrapped up in this idea that I can fix it. And some companies embrace that more than others. Ab absolutely. Um, and I think the, the emotional aspect of repair is really, really paramount because I think the, the thing that's missed when we only talk about, you know, screws and fixings and the physical components of a product is that a lot of things get thrown away when they break more out of frustration mm. and lack of time and even lack of interest or people who can't be bothered more than not having the right fixings. 
Um, so there's plenty of situations where a product is completely repairable, where somebody could, you know, the guide is there online, the, the screwdriver is there, blah, blah, blah. Um, but they just don't have time or, or they need that product too much um, to be without it for a while. Or they're just, you know, not somebody who is confident or feels like they're technically able enough to do even a simple repair. Um, so I think taking into account that emotional aspect and actually looking at your customer and saying, right, well, who are they and what does my product mean to them uh, is really the first thing that you should do when asking whether your product is going to be repaired or not. And that's, yeah, you can imagine the all sorts of conversations going around, on around the design table about what type of product it is that they're designing and how frequently people will be using it and therefore influencing the repair system, yeah. as you say. I know you've got some examples you want to talk about yes. to, to make this feel a bit more real. Yep. Um, so give us your, well, it's not just mobile phone, but your tech um, yep. uh, comparison. So I think there's there's three um, makers of consumer electronics that are really interesting because they go about this in very different ways. Um, the, the first and I think most famously maligned for its repairability is Apple, who um, are quite difficult um, to repair on your own. Um, not, not impossible, but um, they definitely need, in some cases, specialized tools. But if you're under warranty, when it breaks, they've decided to make the repair experience as smooth and luxurious and Apple-like as possible. So it even fits into their sort of brand language. You were sent a beautiful little box. Nice. This is, for example, for the Apple Watch. Um, as soon as you notify them it breaks, you put the broken component back, you ship it back in a box they provide you. They can give you tape, just in case you don't have a roll of brown tape lying around. Um, you're given a new one very, very quickly, and the old one is shipped off to be either repaired or dismantled and taken apart for parts. So they've created this very sort of seamless, smooth, beautiful experience. Um, they've even sort of, on all the copy that they have, you know, they're sort of apologizing for your inconvenience and helping you through all the steps. Um, and it's really a, a repair experience that's built around their brand, which is people buy Apple products because um, they want them to be efficient. They want them to work well. They want them because they're beautiful. They don't want to worry about the innards and the faff of repairing them. And so that's that's a, a repair experience that's really built around what that brand wants to be. But sometimes, I mean, Apple do sometimes get a bit flack from people because because the stuff is difficult to repair, yes. but you're saying that's a conscious decision by Apple to make it part of the user experience that they don't repair it, but Apple does. Yes, um, and I think they they want that to be um, a part of who that company is and a part of the whole experience that you get from them. Um, and in terms of what they then do with the materials, they've also invested a lot mm. on things like dism robotic dismantling and remanufacturing so that they can get those materials back that way. Um, but if you compare them, for instance, to a company on completely the other end of the spectrum, which is Fairphone, who their whole um, approach to consumer electronics is around transparency and longevity and modularity and making you in control of your own, knowing where your components are coming from and knowing how to repair them. Um, they've gone completely down the other route. For them, repair is actually an integral part of the experience and knowing that you can repair it yourself is an integral part of the experience. Mm. So they've designed all the components so that they're very clearly labeled so that you can take them out in some cases without any tools at all, just with your hands. But the crucial thing is they've, 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 they've done it this way so that you can feel good about repairing it, but you don't necessarily have the technical knowledge to do so. So their brand is appealing to people who, want to buy it as a sort of sustainability purchase. Mm -hmm. And those people are not necessarily going to be that tech savvy. Um, so they've decided that even though, you know, this means some trade-offs in terms of the efficiency of the phone and the performance, it's definitely not an Apple phone in that respect. It's actually part of the brand value to have it be like this. And we can see, we've got a picture on the screen here, presumably yep. of a few of the phone components. Yes. And they, they all say in them, top module, speaker module, bottom module. It, it reminds me a little bit of the, oh, what was that phone from a few year, years ago that was getting a lot of publicity? Uh, phone blocks, that was the phone idea. Blocks, 
and it, and I guess it it fits pretty well with that idea, doesn't it? That you can swap out one part for another. Yes, um, swap out one part for another. Um, potentially upgrade them if a new, you know, if if you want to for say a bet a better camera comes along, a, a battery with longer life comes along, that you can sort of swap it out piece by piece. Um, this, this made me chuckle. The 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 literally do write little motivational messages yes, on, on their components. They do. they do. They they encourage you every step of the way. Um, they they actually have little messages inside the phone to tell you how well you're doing for having gotten this to this point and fixed it. Um, which is which is interesting because almost the same approach as Apple have taken with their copy and messaging of telling you, oh, we're very sorry, don't worry, everything is all right, we'll take care of it for you. Um, whereas here, they've also incorporated this kind of brand messaging into repair, but it's actually, it's all about self-sufficiency um, and empowering people and making them feel empowered. Uh, which of much, course- the two, the two brands are actually much more similar than you'd think. Right, right. And it, and it fits very, very yeah. well, the brand values and so on. Um, but you, you touched on something there when you were talking about Fairphone that that's, there are some compromises that get made if you build your phone in this modular repair way. Can you, just in layman's terms, lay out what that all means? Yes. Um, so there's, it's, it's not always the case, um, but you always have to make trade-offs in design. Um, and it's not always the case, but often there is a bit of a trade-off between how modular you make something and how efficient it can be. Um, battery efficient, heat efficient. Um, if you just think about it, you, you're you making things easier to take apart so you can't pack them in as tightly. Um, you leave space for dust and things like that to get in. You can't make things as sealable. You can't make them as protected. Um, so you, you could get into a situation where you have to trade off certain aspects of performance for the ability to repair it. Um, and in some cases, like the Fairphone, they've made that as a conscious decision. Um, in some cases, like Apple, they've, they've gone the other, completely the other way as a conscious decision. Um, but it's, 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 you can't really design a sort of perfectly efficient repair, but it's, it's almost impossible to always hit every single thing that you want it to do at 100%. So it's so again, this is why it's important to sort out what kind of experience your customers want first, because then when that goes back into the design, you can understand what you need to make trade-offs on. So you give us the example of Apple who say, send it back to us, we'll make this a fabulous experience, yep. seamless, we'll apologize for it, but yep. you'll en you'll enjoy being part of that process. Yep. You've got Fairphone who say, um, you buy our product, the great thing about it is you get to repair it and we'll make it as simple as possible for you to do it. It's part of a sort of lifestyle yeah. brand. There's a third example you wanna give us though. Um, yes, so this was um, HP who are almost like firmly in the middle and they are very much in the, I guess, traditional repairability metrics of um, make it easy to get into and replace for somebody who knows what they're doing. So they're, they are actually a large portion of the business is a b2b brand so they're used to the idea of their products being used by sort of people with technical ability or of departments with technical ability um, who just want to be able to get them up and running as fast as possible with the tools they have there so this is the the elite book which is a um, very very dismantleable consumer consumer electronic you wouldn't want to do it if you didn't feel comfortable with it and I think this is the crucial thing. So it's it's designed for the consumer to be able to take it to any kind of repair shop or competent person and be able to have it repaired. Not necessarily for them to do it themselves if that's not the kind of thing that they're good at. But likewise, you said they work with iFixit to, to they did. a yes. repair manual. Yes, they did. So they work with iFixit who are the sort of online hub for um, teardowns and user guides for products. They're actually one of the few companies to actually come and work with them and say, we're going to help you create these guides when normally they have to just sort of tear down things themselves and, and figure it out. Um, because they know that the type of people that they're appealing to are the kind of people who are going to go to places like iFixit, who are gonna download manuals, look through user instructions. And as you can see, I, I think the picture you have up on the screen, um, to compare to the way that the Fairphone is constructed, 
Um, these are components that are all reasonably easy to get to, um, but you still wouldn't want to take them off unless you felt quite comfortable with doing so. Are those QR codes, are they there to help you in the repair process, do you think? or um, You know, sure? I don't know. I, my assumption is that they're probably manufacturing QR codes. But that is a very good point. And that's that's something that I think we've not really touched on this yet, but maybe we talk about it a bit later, is that there, mm. there are a lot of ways that um, that software technology is already and is going to be able to move repair experience mm. beyond just looking at a manual, definitely. So Let's yeah. offer a prize to anyone who scans one of these and tells us exactly <laughs> where it takes them. You better yeah. be quick because I'm about to press stop. Raffle something else too. Okay, so there's three different companies, three different approaches, yep. all built, all sort of baked into the image that the mm -hmm. company wants to have. They've designed the design experience to fit with the, the, the company that they are. You work uh, with lots of different companies around um, product design. What sort of conversations do you have with them about designing a good repair experience? Do you, do you tell them these type of stories and ask them to make a choice or how does it work? Yeah, well, there's not, there's not really a kind of bucket of different experiences that you can, you can pick from. It's very, um, as with these examples, they're very particular to the companies that are using them. And I think this is the case, in fact, with all sort of sustainability, not just repair, but all sustainability initiatives that companies are making it's all you've got to look very hard about first of all who who the company are what the product is who it's being sold to and what does that product mean to them um and you you have to look at it from both a technical perspective and also the user experience perspective so from a technical perspective um actually how does your equipment break you know what what's the most likely failure modes for example um and are they something that could be done from a user competency perspective or, or not? You know, is there, is there anything that's potentially dangerous? That, that, that sort of thing. Um, how often is it going to happen? Um, which also affects what you want the experience to be. Um, and also, is, is your user the kind of person who would want to do it themselves? Are they the kind of person that would want you to do it? Um, and also, what does your product mean to them? Is it something that they can be without for a week while it goes and gets fixed? Or is it something that actually you need to then jump in and provide a replacement and take back the old one? Otherwise, they're just going to chuck it out and buy a new one. So there's all those aspects of it um, to do with the user part. Um, and then there's also the aspect of what level of service can you provide and the whole business model aspect of it. And do you want to be, for example owning your products in a lease system where you are always there to be able to take them back? Um, or is it something where your products kind of high value enough that you can provide uh, like a full service system? Or, and I think this is the really interesting part, um, you you don't, you're, you're not able to provide a full kind of uh, optimized service system. Um, but are there ways that you can optimize your the other parts of your service your consumer touch points um so your your call centers your supporting materials um the websites that your customers go to are the ways that you can optimize that for not very much cost to address the the repair experience in a better way i mean uh, let's come on to the building in the yeah. systems uh, a little bit more detail on that in just a second but i'll take the opportunity to ask our audience Tell us about a design or rather a repair experience that you've had. Was it optimal, suboptimal? And um, what worked, what didn't work for you? Let us know. And um, we'll, we can bring those up in conversation with Grace as this conversation goes on. Yep. Um, and of course you can use, you can put comments in on the page you're watching this on. You can use the hashtag thinkdiff. And we've got a team of people feeding your thoughts and questions to me here in the studio. But yeah, Grace, to that point about, um, I mean, designing for repair, whether it's a service that you provide for your users or, or whether you're changing the design of a product so they do it themselves, yeah. takes a lot more work and effort, one presumes, than simply designing a product and saying goodbye to it, um, which has been the status quo for many products for some time now. Yeah. Does this create headaches for companies? Um, it could. It's, it's more things to consider, certainly. Um, but I think it is it's not just an extra drag. 
um, it, it's something that could provide benefits for them in a lot of ways. Uh, so a nice example is actually a fact about Airbnb ratings, bizarrely enough, doesn't sound related, but somebody found that the the best sort of five star plus Airbnb ratings were not when everything went smoothly and nothing bad happened. They were when something bad had happened, but it had been fixed and the host had, you know, sorted it out really quickly and they'd been really nice about it and they'd compensated them for it, blah, blah, blah. Those were the ones that had the best customer experience. So actually it's, it's something inherent in the way that we, we view experiences. If we're rescued by somebody, we're going to think of them a lot more highly than if they just sort of, you know, if nothing bad happened and they were just sort of nice to us. Um, so actually it's, it's a part of customer service. It's a consumer touch point. You can turn it into, and right now often it's a really bad consumer touch point um, because the, the sort of basic tools, usually sort of a customer service line plus an instruction manual that you throw away when you buy the product or it's in a drawer somewhere in your kitchen under some stuff and you know you can't be bothered to find it plus talking on the phone to somebody who can't see what you're seeing and you're having this sort of blind back and forth very straight in conversation and then you give up and buy a new one um that damages a brand's reputation um and that and it is it's it's not just so not just from a sustainability perspective and this is something that um is good to do to keep materials in circulation, but it's also a good thing to consider from the way people experience your company, certainly. So, I mean, it's a lot more complex, basically, than yeah. simply product design. There's a whole it's, load of components to yeah. consider. It, yeah, it's a sort of product service design and you um, have to, your customer experiences your product. They also experience all the touch points they have with your organization and it's making sure that those line up um, in a way that does create a good experience for them. Now, surely all to most of us have experienced this. A product breaks, yep. we ask someone if they can fix it, we make initial inquiries and we're told, eh, you might as well buy a new one. It's, it's cheaper mm. to do that than to repair it. Why is that the case? Is it still mm. the case and what might change there? I think in a, in a lot of cases, it's, it's still the case um, because a lot of products have been they're optimized for production efficiency um, whereas uh, and materials are cheap um, whereas fixing something takes labor which takes time um, and I think slowly that is changing and it's changing in various ways um, one of them is through people um, in fact companies like HP for example um, having different kind of pricing structures and models and thinking of um, their products as a service rather than as simply components that they're putting out. Um, another, another reason is because, because labor is expensive. I know some countries um, have decided to lower taxes on repair activities to sort of bring those into parity. So Sweden, right? Um, Sweden. Yeah. Sweden has done that. Um, and also the, the labor issue comes into play partly because a lot of the time when we talk about repair, we're talking about, you know, switching out components, but actually that's not the most time consuming part of repair. Often the most time consuming part is actually figuring out what on earth has gone wrong. So the troubleshooting process. Um, so often it's, it's cheaper to buy a new one just because it would take some unknown, but undoubtedly quite long time to find out what's actually going on. Um, and there are, ways and we can go into this that uh, more sort of smart technology is being introduced into products to actually help them self-diagnose for example um to to cut out that process and to sort of partly automate this quite expensive process of figuring out what's going on let's jump into uh, future uh, possibilities in just a minute mm -hmm. but some questions have come in from the audience and please keep them coming in Yep. So I'm going to hit you with three, Grace. Okay. One comes from David. What's your view on a product passport? Have you seen much development in this concept? Uh, yes, um, I, I think it's a great idea. Um, well, and tell us what it is as well, because I don't know. Uh, yes, um, thanks, David. Great question. Um, so the idea of a product passport is having a data uh, 
basically a, a bank of data associated with a product. Um, the other thing that it's often called is a digital twin. Um, so it is, it's a data that contains all the information about your product, where it was manufactured, um, what's been done to it, uh, where all the materials have come from, all of that traceability. Then as it changes hands, um, how long it's been in use, potentially the number of cycles, if it's been repaired, that gets updated, etc. Um, I think that I think that's a very interesting and very positive development because, as I said before, with this troubleshooting thing, so much of repair is about figuring out what on earth is going on. That shortens that massively because if you know the history, um, if you know what products have been replaced in the past, you know how long it's been in service, potentially what conditions it's been in. Um, it's much easier to figure that out. And it's also much easier for companies if they want to implement reverse logistics and start taking parts and components back, if they can immediately identify them. Um, and it simplifies, you know, so, so much of the faff in getting something fixed is not technical, but sort of administrative. If you can have a, a product passport that you can sort of scan or send back to the company and they immediately know exactly what product you have, where it's been from and what they can do with it, then I think that'll be very good for repair. Yeah, we've heard about that type of idea in, uh, in many different fields in the yeah. built environment. I think we yeah. were hearing about that yesterday, actually, in a diff session. Related to data, but in a slightly different way, Jennifer's, mm -hmm. Jennifer's saying that what people really want when it comes to their mobile phones mm -hmm. isn't the materials, but the data that's inside it. That's the thing that's valuable. Yeah. All those phone numbers, your pictures, etc. cetera. Um, so how, how, how is that factored into the design experience? Yeah, no, that's interesting. So that that's a really good example because one of the one of the most common things when a mobile phone breaks is people saying, "I want to get my data off. Um, please, can I do this?" Um, and I know it it varies. I don't know exactly, but it varies between phone manufacturers whether this is something that they will do. Um, but I think if you were to design, if you if for a phone you were to design a good repair, repair experience, I think that would be definitely one of the things that you would prioritize um, because the, that's almost the first thing that people go for. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the fact that the fact that people aren't attached to the individual materials and components is also very, very true. Um, and I think as, uh, which also goes into a lot of these things are now, companies are now providing these products as a service rather than as a specific product so they're starting to acknowledge that what you know for instance for a pair of headphones what you value is not the headphones themselves specifically the sort of bits of metal and rubber and etc um, but the ability to listen to music um, and so if you think of it as right we're gonna we're gonna provide that person with the ability to listen to music whenever they want to and make sure that they aren't without it then we can, for instance, perhaps take them back or repair components or provide them with a new one. And but and I think there are a few companies, headphone companies that have started to do this because they know that otherwise um, the, the person is going to still have their headphones, but they're broken or they're faulty and they're trying to get through their morning commute without their podcast to listen to. They're going to get annoyed. They're going to buy a new pair. Imagine, because, imagine the hell. No headphones on your morning imagine, commute. Imagine. Dreadful. I can't even think about it. <laughs> right. Um, another question. Here's one from Michael. Uh, talking about products being cheaper to buy a new one than repair it. Do you have any examples of companies who incentivize customers to repair rather than replace? Interesting. Well, I think I think Fearphone is one of them. Um, I think it's it's the best example. It it keeps the cost of repair components. I think if you if you go onto its website and you compare the cost of the phone with the cost of the repair components, it's always, um, it, it, you'd have to basically be replacing the whole phone in order for it to be cheaper to replace the whole phone, if you see what I mean. Um, there isn't that disparity. Um, whereas, you know, with, with some other examples of consumer electronics, you can see that the, the pricing is so high that you might as well. Um, so there's that. Um, there are a lot of companies that incentivize handing things back um, after use, which is a diff which is a different approach to doing that. So it's it's saying to people not necessarily incentivizing you to repair, but incentivizing you to at least give us back something 
um, and we can give you a discount so you can keep the materials in loop. Um, Another question then, well, what is ex extended producer responsibility and how does it fit into all of this? Yes, that's a very interesting question. Um, so extended producer responsibility um, generally covers uh, the, the manufacturer being responsible for what happens after point of sale of their products. Um, and this is, can be framed in various different ways, um, including, you know, the, the, often the recyclability of the products is what's taken into account in sort of how much unrecyclable material you, you are creating. Um, but there is legislation that is continually coming in about repair being a part of this as well. Um, so in the EU, for instance, legislation about right to repair for certain home appliances, that people have to make sure that there's spare parts available, make sure that there's manuals available, um, and that kind of, and uh, so that you're not, you're never sort of in a situation where the machine is repairable, but it's just for lack of parts or et cetera. So um, I think that's definitely, that's the sort of legal and policy side of it. Um, and it's partly to do with just keeping information there, keeping parts there, making sure in the worst case, um, it's gonna be able to be fixed. Um, and I think that's that's almost like the backbone. I think that sits behind all of this. Mm. Um, and then the the user experience side is basically how easy that is in practice for a user of the product. Um, because you know you could you could meet you could meet producer responsibility guidelines by just sort of putting your manual up in a website and not announcing it to anybody. Mm. But that's not in effect actually practically creating an experience that then is going to you know be optimal but it's a workaround for those who wish to have the workaround i guess yes um yesterday at the diff mm -hmm. we heard from um ds smith and costa the coffee company who yeah. were talking about uh, recyclable coffee cups and how they're standardized um, across the industry. Basically, every coffee cup is essentially the same, although they look a little bit different externally. Mm -hmm. um, and the great thing about that is that they can all go into one bin and they can go through a recycling process and be put back out there. Yep. Mobile phones are a little bit more complex than uh, coffee cups. Yes. <laughs> Do we see a future whereby, maybe not just mobile phones, of course, that's not all we're talking about here, yep. but where more complex objects could be designed in a standardized way so that anyone could work on them, fix them and put them back out there. Yeah, um, that, that is an interesting one. I think it, uh, it depends for the coffee cups. Um, they're going into general recycling. And so they're going into municipal recycling systems, which um, are standardized, sometimes not standardized um, for a whole country. Um, and so it's important for that kind of case, because it's a very cheap low cost item, which is gonna go in household bins or municipal bins. Standardization makes a lot of sense um, because you don't want to put the burden on the recyclers to have to try and sort things and get contaminants and everything like that. Um, if a product is high value enough that that company can be in control of the closed loop system, um, and they can be in control of how it's recycled and, and the technology by which it's recycled, um, then I think st I think standardization then matters less um, because it's it's never going to and I and I think this is a really interesting question and this is some a, a big sort of part of deciding what your circular strategy is going to be as a company is can you in any way control where your waste components go? Um, because if you can get faulty items directed back to you and you can very tightly control how they're, um, as, as Apple does, how they're dismantled and where all these parts go, um, then you might actually want to make the product less standardized and optimize towards your processes. Um, but if you know that this is just going to go in people's household waste bins, then you have to look at creating something which is standardized and built to those standards. Right, so okay. Slightly model dependent as well. Grace, you are going to tell us about some exciting uh, uh, future ideas in product repair. Um, so what have we got? What's, 
what's already with us and what's on the horizon? What does the, the future of repair look like? Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, the future of repair can go in, can go in various directions, I think. Um, but one of the most exciting things is the way that um, technologies which are already sort of in place in B2B settings, so in factories with medical equipment, very sort of high value, um, high precision stuff, is sort of coming slowly more into consumer experience. So in, in the B2B sector for a while, they've been able to do quite complex remote repairs. So on medical imaging equipment, for example, is a good is a good example. A lot of the data, there's a lot of sensors inside those machines. That data is collected, um, it's analyzed um, to the point where a remote engineer can sort of go into your MRI machine, figure out what's wrong, tell you what to do, get the part ordered. And even more recently to the point where you can even predict when a part's gonna fail based on past data um, and get the part sent out before it even does so. Um, and current data as well, I guess. Like or, Yeah, and current data, but also by aggregating, you know, all the MRI machines in the world and the patterns that led to, for example, some kind of part blowing and then predict when somebody else is going to. So that's obviously MRI machines are um, worth millions of pounds. Um, and that's previously was a very, very sort of high end thing. Um, but we're seeing little bits of it start to creep into the consumer sphere as well. So um, HP has started doing a ink as a service where it actually can measure when your ink's about to run out and send it. Um, and also with Bosch's connected uh, kitchen there's features in there which I believe are going to be able to allow remote repair. So to allow an engineer to actually sort of listen into your device, figure out what's wrong, decide whether you can fix it or they need to actually send somebody out um, and actually optimize that whole process. So I think the the, the opportunity for remote repair um, as more things become Internet of Things connected is is going to be massive. And I mean, it's beyond the scope of this conversation, but there are additional questions there, aren't there, around who gets access to data and what that means for us societally. Maybe that's a conversation point for another diff session. Could be, could be. I think that's that's quite a big can of worms, but it's very, very important. Grace, thank you very much for this uh, this tour of what the repair landscape looks like today and what it could like look like in the future. So from remote repair to motivational messages inside our smartphones, and um, we have covered the whole range of uh, repair services that are available. Um, I like to thank Grace Kane, who was our super guest in this show. You've been watching the diff where there are hundreds of sessions for you to watch at thinkdiff.co. So if you've enjoyed this, go watch some more there. They're all available to catch up and we will see you next time. Goodbye.